So there are a few types of chest pains. Like I said, there's the STEMI and the NSTEMI, and then there's stable and unstable angina. Of course, there are more types of chest pain that are not on this slide, but for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to do a really focused review. So when boards give you types of chest pain, they're usually telling you whether the, the pain is typical, atypical, or non-anginal. And the, the where that comes from is called the diamond classification of chest pain. This is really, really useful to know for boards and extremely high yield to know before you start rotations. So I'm going to go through it because it's going to help everybody at multiple stages in their career. So basically, the diamond classification of chest pain classifies chest pain based on three things. So there are three conditions, and any one or all of these conditions can be met, and you score the type of chest pain from zero to three. Those three things are the location of the chest pain, whether it's you know substernal, left-sided, whether or not the chest pain is relieved with nitroglycerin, and whether or not the chest pain is worse with, exer worse with exertion. Excuse me. So those are the three things. Let's say that a patient has all three of these features. They would have three out of three, which would be called typical chest pain. If they only have two of these features, they would have what's called atypical chest pain. And if they had one or zero of these features, they would have what's called they would have um, what we call non-anginal chest pain. Now, why is this important? Let's talk about boards first. On boards. They, will, they sometimes tell you typical versus atypical chest pain, which can already kind of create the image in your head. Uh, is this an MI? And should I be thinking about the workup for an MI? Or is this just angina? And should I be thinking about the workup or the treatment or the pathophysiology of just angina? So it's really useful. Think about it. Let's say that a patient has all three of these features. They have substernal chest pain, it's worse with exertion, and it's relieved with nitroglycerin. Does that sound more like a heart attack, like an MI? Or does that sound more like angina? Well, it sounds like angina, of course. So what's the takeaway here? If you have three out of three, you're more likely to have angina. But as you go down in number, right, as you approach zero out of three, it's more likely that it's non-anginal and that it's an MI. It's really useful for boards. It's extremely useful uh, clinically. And you will impress your intendings big time when you're uh, rotating in internal medicine or in the emergency room if you can tell them that the patient's having typical or atypical chest pain. So keep that in mind. The diamond classification of chest pain, super high yield, really, really useful. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the different types of chest pain, specifically the different types of myocardial infarctions. So you have a STEMI and an NSTEMI. This is what we're going to focus on today. High yield for step one and, level, and um, step two is that you need to understand the depth of cardiac tissue involved in the different types of MIs. So the STEMI is a transmural infarction, which means that the entire thickness of the wall, if you were to take a slice of the heart that you see in this diagram below, transmural means the entire wall is affected. In the end, STEMI, it's just subendocardial. So it's just that first little layer below the endocardium, and hence its name, subendocardial. The, the pattern affects what you see on the ECG. So that's why in a STEMI, there's ST segment elevation, because the full thickness or the transmural thickness of the heart is being infarcted. In the end, STEMI, it's just a portion of it, and that's why you see ST segment um, depression. So the electrical change you see on ECG is a result of the thickness of the cardiac tissue involved. And this is really super high yield. Boards love to say um, they won't give you STEMI or NSTEMI in the answer choices. They'll just say something like transmural infarction, and you have to know that that means STEMI. Um, Consequently, they might say subendocardial infarction, and you have to know that that means NSTEMI. So this is really, really high yield. Now, another high yield point, both on boards and clinically, is that if it's a STEMI, it's emergent. They have to go to the cath lab within 90 minutes. If it's an NSTEMI, they still need to go to the cath lab, but you do that urgently. You don't do that emergently. So high yield, keep that in mind. Let's talk a little bit about angina. So everybody thinks they know angina until it shows up on boards, and then people are like, oh, shit, I don't really know what this is. So chill. Stable angina is a demand mismatch, and unstable angina is also a demand mismatch. And why do I bring that up? A STEMI is a supply mismatch. No matter what, there's 100% occlusion of a, of a coronary vessel, and the heart cannot supply itself with enough blood. There's just a supply mismatch, but anything else, stable angina, unstable angina, and an end STEMI, that's all demand mismatch. So that is why the STEMI is particularly lethal and why we have to get them to a cath lab within 90 minutes. So with that in mind, let's talk about the stable and unstable angina. Stable angina is going to be chest pain that usually is worse with exertion and gets better at rest. Unstable angina is going to be chest pain that occurs at rest. 
and they're very different. Now, stable angina usually classically proceeds to unstable angina as the, the coronary artery disease gets worse. So um, it's important to keep that in mind because the workup for chest pain and, and what you do and what you discharge the patient with um, as to like what medications and all that stuff is really dependent on the type of chest pain that they're having. So let's talk about the really high yield workup for chest pain and that's on this slide. This is our last slide. This is really high yield for boards and extremely useful clinically um, if that's not already obvious. So let's say that you have a patient that presents with chest pain. The first thing you do is you get an ECG. If you have to choose between like five different things that all sound good, the answer is ECG because you have to know right off the bat, is this a STEMI? And if it is, how do I get them to the cath lab within 90 minutes? So the first thing you do is get the ECG, but since you're gonna be doing everything at once in real clinical practice, you're gonna order an ECG, you're gonna order cardiac enzymes, you're gonna give the patient aspirin, you're gonna get them hooked up on a monitor, you're gonna like really prepare just in case the worst case scenario is happening here. Now you can see that the arrows in the algorithm change color here. The red arrow is the worst, the orange is like bad but not as bad, and yellow is, you know, this patient's gonna live. That's it's better than red or orange. So after that, you, you look at the ECG and you ask yourself, is this a myocardial infarction or is this not a myocardial infarction? Now, how do you know that? Well, we talked about this. If it's a STEMI, you'll see ST segment elevations. And if it's an NSTEMI, you'll see ST segment depression. If you have the MI, you have to figure out, is it the STEMI or the NSTEMI? If it's the STEMI, the, the, the saying is door to balloon within 90 minutes. Get them to the cath lab within 90 minutes. It is crucial, it's the answer on boards, it's the answer on step one, it's the answer on step two, it's the answer when you get pimped on rotations. If it's an NSTEMI, they still need to go to the cath lab. The answer is still gonna be catheterization. However, it's gonna be urgent and not emergent. And I've seen that question before. They'll, they'll ask you, is this emergent or is this urgent? And you need to know that it's urgent. It needs to be done, but it doesn't have to be done within 90 minutes, so it's not as emergent as a STEMI. Now, if, it's not, if you go back to that ECG and it's not a myocardial infarction, but the patient is still having chest pain, it's very likely that it's angina, right? It's non-MI, um, it's anginal chest pain. So now this is the classic chest pain rule out, and you're going to hear that term a lot once you start your rotations. And basically what that is, is patient came in with risk factors for coronary artery disease, risk factors for an MI, but they're not actively having an MI. So what do we do? Usually those patients get admitted to the hospital. They get, they get admitted to the internal medicine service. They go up to the floor and throughout their stay over the next couple of days, you're repeating ECGs, you're repeating the cardiac enzymes. The next morning, they always get the stress test. So they go, um, you make their heart rate increase, you, make their, you increase their demand and you see what happens. If during the stress test, it shows you that there is a compromised uh, coronary vessels, then you know that they need to ultimately, you know, go to the, go to the cath lab or, or get stents, you know, something like that. But if not, they're, they're discharged to follow up with their cardiologist and you discharge them on Saba, S-A-B-A. -A. Those are the four medications that you have to know. There's a ton of board questions. This is really, really high yield about the medications that are shown um, to improve survival in patients with coronary artery disease. And you need to know that it's the statin the ACE inhibitor, the beta blocker, and aspirin. Um, let's just pause for one second and go over these medications because they're, they're extremely high yield and I've seen so many, so many questions on these. So uh, if you understand the, the pathophysiology of coronary artery disease, you, you kind of already understand why some of this stuff works. So the, the reason that the coronary vessel gets occluded is because of a plaque buildup. So you put them on a statin to try to limit the, the amount of plaque or the degree of plaque buildup that they have. The aspirin is the antiplatelet agent that has been shown, shown to improve survival. Beta blocker is really important because patients with coronary artery disease, especially post MI, um, they have the propensity to die within, I think it's like the first 24 to 48 hours from ventricular arrhythmia and a beta blocker prevents ventricular arrhythmia. Um, so it's really, really good at slowing down that as well as kind of slowing down the heart so that the demand isn't as much. And then the ACE inhibitor. So it, it's really, really worth it for you guys to put in the time to understand the pathway for, for how the ACE enzyme works. But basically the ACE enzyme causes remodeling of the heart, which just kind of puts the heart into this vicious cycle of, um, further compromised function. So when you start somebody on an ACE inhibitor, you get all of the protective effects of preventing remodeling. And just as a little tidbit here, another high yield point, it's um, it's renal protective. So you, you get so many benefits from these four medications, you discharge them on Saba. 
But that's our rapid review of chest pain. This was a little bit more clinically focused than some of our other videos, but I, again, I just want to point out that the way that chest pain and myocardial infarctions are being tested on boards, even at step one, has become more clinical because of how many people in the United States have coronary artery disease. So it's definitely worth your time to understand this. Again, uh, when you're studying these, it's important to understand each disease process individually, but don't get don't fall into that trap of knowing what stable angina is, but then not being able to differentiate it from the other types of angina and the different types of myocardial infarctions, because the way that it will be presented to you on boards is through a differential. So it's really high yield. Good luck, guys.